come let's deep dive into the interpretation of hess charting when we are interpreting the hess chart interpretation of the size shape and position of the various points present in the hess chart is very very important specifically because the hess chart is based on the principle of foveal projection and the position of the fields will reflect the position of the eyes okay so what happens in hess chart is that the higher field usually belongs to the higher eye okay and this is in contrast to diplopia where the higher image will belong to the lower eye let us have a look at these two charts. You can see that the right eye chart seems to be at a higher level compared to the left eye chart. So what does this mean? This means that the right eye is actually hypertrophic and the left eye is hypotrophic that means at a lower level. Okay, so the position of the central dot in each field is very, very important. It actually indicates the deviation in the primary position for that eye. That means in the field of the left eye, when the right eye is fixing, you can see over here the central dot is displaced down. That means that the eye is hypotropic, whereas the right eye field, which is charted with the left eye fixing, actually is hypertropic. Now, do you understand the laws of extraocular motility very well? Okay, because that is very important to understand the Hess chart. So, we shall be discussing about the Herring's law of equal innovation and the Sherrington's law. The Herring's law of equal innovation states that during any conjugate eye movement, equal innovation will flow to the pair of yoke muscles. Now, for example, if you were to carry out a direct elevation, we need equal innovation to the superior rectus of the left eye and to the superior rectus of the right eye. So these eye models are as if this is your right eye and your left eye. Now, suppose you were to carry out levoversion. In levoversion, the left eye lateral rectus and the right eye medial rectus will get equal innovation. In dextroversion, the right eye lateral rectus and the left eye medial rectus will get equal innovation. Now, what about in levo elevation? In levo elevation, the superior rectus of the left eye and the inferior oblique of the right eye will get equal innovation. Similarly, in dextro elevation, the superior rectus of the right eye and the inferior oblique of the left eye will get the innovation. Now, this also applies for vergence. Suppose you want a convergence movement, then the medial rectus of both the eyes will be stimulated so that both the eyes can actually AD, that is, adduct and cause convergence. So, here you can, this is a reference image. You can see that for various conjugate movements, a pair of yoke muscles. The Sherrington's law of reciprocal innovation it actually states that. Whenever a movement is carried out, there is a primary actor or the primary agonist. So that primary agonist is going to receive the impulse to contract. However, there is also an antagonist sitting over there. So an equivalent but inhibitory impulse will be sent to the antagonist which is going to relax. So agonist contract and the antagonist will relax and therefore a movement will happen. So for example, if you were to abduct an eye that is abduction, you need basically the lateral rectus, which is the agonist, to contract. So a stimulating impulse will be sent to the lateral rectus. But at the same time, we do not want the medial rectus to pull the eye inwards. And therefore, the medial rectus will relax. And therefore, an inhibitory signal will be sent to the medial rectus. So this equal but opposite innovations which are sent to the uh, pair of agonist and antagonist muscle in the same eye is called the Sherrington's law. Similarly, if the eye were to adduct, that is look towards the nasal side, the medial rectus will receive the stimulating impulse, whereas the lateral rectus will receive the inhibitory impulse. Now, at this point, let us discuss how to use these laws in the HES charting. Why are they so important? Now, due to the Herring's law of equal innovation, the smaller field that we see in the Hess chart, whether it belongs to the right eye or the left eye, okay, and it says that it actually belongs to the eye with the primary limitation of movement. Now, for example, here you have a Hess chart. The smaller field is belonging to the left eye field, right? So what does it mean? It means that when you are charting the field of the left eye with the right eye fixing, it is showing a smaller field because there is limitation or say paralysis or palsy present in the left eye. 
So the field which is smaller basically indicates the eye which has limitation of movement. Similarly, you can also see over here in this chart of the right eye say, the original points which were to be tested were located and they were marked over here in red color. However, the plotting is marked in green color here, right? So you can see that there's actually an inward displacement of these dots and this indicates basically the direction of the underaction of the affected muscle. So for, for example, over here, we know that for abduction in the right eye here for example we need this lateral rectus muscle and what is happening to this outer field square this field is actually displaced inwards so as these points or the field is displaced inwards it actually tells you that there is an underaction of the lateral rectus muscle this is happening not just with the outer field but also with the inner field you can see the original points were supposed to be somewhere here but they are also shifted inwards Similarly, overaction can also be made out uh, in these HES charts. So suppose these were the original points where they're supposed to be recorded, but the recording is somewhere outside the chart. So what does it indicate? It indicates that there is an overaction which is occurring in the medial rectus area. So the, which is the muscle over here? This is the medial rectus, which is responsible for uh, looking towards the nose or for adduction. And here we can clearly see that there is overaction uh, noted by the outward displacement of these dots okay and this displacement will occur in the direction of the main action of the muscle now under action happens when the muscle is palsied and overaction basically is occurring because of the overacting contralateral synergist in this larger field so i will explain to you in a while about the muscle sequelae in detail now, at this point, it is very important for me to ask you that are you aware of the yoke muscles? Do you understand what is the synergist, what is an antagonist and what is an agonist? Okay. And if you are not, I will advise you that you visit this video and clarify your concepts first before you deep dive into the HES chart. So the link will be given somewhere here located by the arrow. Now, let us move forward and... Uh, one important point to be noted is that always, always make sure that you also examine all the points, okay? Examine the inner fields and also the outer fields. The outer field is also important. It should be examined very carefully for very small underactions and overactions, which may not be very apparent on the inner fields. Now, sometimes you might actually see the fields to be of equal size. It, it is not always true that you have a smaller field and a larger field. Sometimes you see equal size fields. So what does it mean? It means that maybe there is a symmetrical limitation of movement in both the eyes or maybe you are dealing with a non paralytic strabismus where there are no muscle sequelae because the muscle sequelae are actually responsible for that underaction and overaction leading to a small field and a larger field in the opposite eyes. Or sometimes what happens is that in a very long standing paralytic strabismus, there will be muscle sequelae that will develop and that will lead to concomitance. So now let us discuss about these important muscle sequelae and muscle sequelae usually are seen in case of neurogenic palsy. So there are basically three types that we'll discuss. The first one is, as you can see over here, suppose you have a palsy of the right lateral rectus muscle. So we can say that the right lateral rectus muscle is actually underacting. Now, what will happen to its contralateral synergist, or we can say its yoke muscle, that is the left medial rectus, according to the Herring's law, if the right eye lateral rectus is palsied, it means that in order to look towards the right side, okay, or in order to uh, carry out a dextroversion in this case, the brain has to send greater impulse to this lateral rectus muscle. Now, if greater impulse is being sent to this lateral rectus muscle, obviously greater impulse will also be sent to the medial rectus muscle and this is in accordance to the Herring's law. And therefore, you will see overaction of the lateral, uh, sorry, of the medial rectus muscle of the left eye. Okay, so on HES chart, although there is palsy of the right lateral rectus, which will be seen as the inward displacement or, um, you know, decreased size of the HES chart. But in the other eye, because of the overaction, because of the increase 
uh, impulses or innervation sent to the yoke muscle there will be outer displacement of the H charge. So this is your first muscle sequelae that is overaction of the contralateral synergist and the contralateral synergist for the later rectus is the medial rectus right so this happens because of the herring's law due to the additional innovation to the palsied muscle i hope you understood that now we know that the right lateral rectus is palsied or underacting now what will happen to its direct antagonist in the same eye which is called the right medial rectus now the right medial rectus actually has no opposition from the left uh, from the right lateral rectus because the lateral rectus is actually palsied and because of that it will develop a contracture and on the head chart it will be recorded as overaction okay so this is your second muscle sequelae that means there will be a contracture of the ipsilateral antagonist or the direct antagonist and this happens because of the sherrington's law because this ipsilateral antagonist has no opposition from the palsied muscle now we know that the right medial rectus is already in a contracted state right so in order to carry out say levoversion okay we need right medial rectus and the left lateral rectus because the right medial rectus is already in a contracted state it needs much less innervation and because of the herring's law what will happen the left lateral rectus will also receive less innervation and therefore it will appear as if the left lateral rectus is actually underacting now this is called secondary inhibition of the contralateral antagonist now you might ask why it is called an antagonist because this left this right lateral rectus which is the primary paratic muscle its synergist is the left medial rectus now this left lateral rectus is actually the antagonist of this left medial rectus which is the synergist of the primary paratic muscle and therefore this is called an antagonist or a contralateral antagonist right so there will be a secondary inhibition of the contralateral antagonist and this happens because of the herring's law now let us learn the interpretation through some of the examples this is the first example carefully observe and tell me which one is the smaller field the smaller field is present in the right eye that means there is limitation of movement in the right eye now the eye which is affected which has limitation of the movement if you are measuring deviation in that eye that becomes the primary deviation if you are measuring and plotting in the other eye that becomes the secondary deviation if you notice the displacement of the h chart obviously the deviation in the secondary uh, deviation that means the left eye is much greater than that of the right eye which is a primary deviation and this indicates that we are dealing with neurogenic palsy let us now make observation in the right eye so carefully observe the central dot the central dot actually seems to be displaced nasally right that means that there is esotropia similarly look at your recordings or plotting of the hess chart carefully the outer field points are again displaced uh, displaced nasally or inwards similarly the inner plottings is also displaced nasally or inwards what does it mean it means that there is a lateral rectus under action now let us observe the left eye chart what do you observe in the left eye in the left eye also the central dot seems to be displaced more towards the nasal side or towards the right and there it means that the eye also has esotropia however there is also an outer displacement originally the points were supposed to be here but the inner field is actually reaching the points of the outer field and the outer field points are almost going outside the chart it means that there is an overaction of the muscle which is responsible for that mo uh, that movement that is the adduction and the muscle is the medial rectus that means there is a medial rectus overaction therefore diagnosing this hess chart this is a case of right eye lateral rectus palsy okay and we know that the lateral rectus is supplied by the sixth nerve so this is a sixth nerve palsy or the right eye lateral rectus pals palsy along with that we saw one muscle sequelae in this case that is the contralateral synergist overaction and the contralateral synergist in this case is the medial rectus and you can see overaction of the left eye medial rectus let us take one more example and carefully observe these fields okay so now if you observe carefully they are almost looking equal in size not like the previous one 
but still if you have to comment you can say that maybe the left eye feel is little bit smaller than the right eye so we will study considering the left eye is abnormal and the note we notice that first of all the central dot again seems to be shifted towards the right side or nasally that means there is esotropia apart from that here what you are observing is that the the what is more prominent here is the outer displacement of the inner and the outer medial fields or the medial part of the chart okay again the chart is going outside of course there is under action of the lateral rectus as well okay the recordings are much more displaced towards the nasal side in fact the entire chart is actually displaced more towards the medial side or the nasal side indicating that there is medial rectus overaction and the lateral rectus under action if you observe the right eye you find somewhat similar picture that means the central dot is shifted towards the nasal side that means there is esotropia there is an inward displacement of the inner and the outer lateral fields that means left uh, that means the lateral rectus under action is there and there is an outer displacement going almost outside the chart okay towards the nasal side or towards the medial side indicating that there is an mr over action so this this actually looks that there is a comitant squint however we are dealing with a left eye lateral rectus palsy and in this case the muscle sequelae are actually fully developed so the first sequelae is that obviously we have the left eye primary paresis or the primary palsy along with that we have overaction of the contralateral synergis the contralateral synergis is the mr over here and you can see there is overaction of the contralateral synergis apart from that you have overaction of the ipsilateral antagonist that is the medial rectus medial rectus over here and this happens because of the contracture and we have secondary inhibition of the contralateral lateral rectus and this is called contralateral antagonist okay so i hope this is clear if you didn't understand this properly i would advise you to revise muscle sequelae again now let us take another example so consider this hess chart here which field is looking smaller to you obviously the field on the left eye seems to be a little bit compressed superiorly that means this is a smaller field and maybe the left eye is the one which has palsy and the right eye seems to be somewhat bigger so studying the left eye chart what do we observe we observe first of all the central dot and the chart as such is shifted somewhat downwards that means there is hypotropia of the eye and you can see there is a downward displacement also called the inner displacement that means towards the inner part of the chart okay of these outer and the inner squares it means that there is a weakness of the superior rectus and somewhat of the inferior oblique as well because these two muscles are responsible for the elevation of the eye now considering the right eye chart what do you see in the right eye chart here you see the central dot is actually shifted in the upward direction originally it was meant to be here but it is here right so the chart is shifted in the upward direction so this is called hypertropia and there is an upward displacement of the upper border of the inner and the outer fields and more so in the adduction side that means more so on nasal side where the muscle which is principally responsible for this is the inferior oblique that means here you have inferior oblique over action so what are we dealing with so basically we are dealing with a palsy of the left superior rectus so there is a left superior rectus palsy along with that there is overaction of the right side inferior oblique muscle which is a contralateral synergis okay so only one muscle sequelae now let us see this chart over here so here which one is the smaller field the smaller field is the right eye so here if you feel that you i'm going a little bit fast you can actually pause the video or you might even slow down the playback speed so the right eye field over here is the smaller so that means that the right eye is affected so we will be studying now first the right eye so what do you observe in right eye carefully first of all where is the chart shifted the chart is shifted upwards that means there is hypertropia that means the muscles which are involved in depression might be affected so the muscles are the superior oblique and the inferior rectus 
and you can see that there's actually an upper displacement of the lower border of the inner and the outer field. It means that the superior oblique is underacting. Little bit of inferior rectus, but predominantly you see that the superior oblique is underacting over here. Apart from that, you can also make out that here the recording, the chart recordings are going outside the chart. It means that the inferior oblique is actually overacting in the same eye. The left eye, if you consider here, the chart or the central dot is shifted downwards. That means the eye has hypotropia, that is the downward displacement. And along with that, you actually see over here the overaction of the inferior rectus muscle and the superior oblique muscle okay now apart from that what else what else can you observe here you can see that the superior rectus area there is some sort of underaction. So this is called superior rectus underaction. so what are we dealing with we know the problem is actually in the right eye so we have a right eye superior oblique palsy that is a fourth nerve palsy because the trochlear nerve supplies your superior oblique so predominantly, this is the area of palsy. So superior oblique is affected. Apart from that, what did you see? You saw that in the same eye, the right eye inferior oblique is overacting. So that is your ipsilateral antagonist overaction. That is one muscle sequel. In the other eye, we saw that there was overaction of the left eye superior rectus. Now, superior rectus is actually a synergist of superior oblique. Both of them, they try to actually bring the eye down. Okay. So, therefore, the counterlateral synergist, according to the Herring's law, is overacting. So, there, this is one more muscle sequelae. You can see that the right eye inferior rectus is, uh, the left eye inferior rectus is actually overacting. Apart from that, you have this underaction of this left eye superior rectus. And this happens because of the secondary inhibition. This is called inhibitional palsy. So what did I tell you? Because the ipsilateral antagonist or the direct antagonist, which in this case is the inferior oblique, will undergo a state of contracture. It does not need much of innovation to it uh, to carry out a movement. And therefore, this muscle that is the inferior oblique and its synergist, that is the superior rectus, will get less innovation. And therefore, the superior rectus will look as if it is underacting. And this superior rectus muscle, which is the synergist of inferior oblique, will be, cause, will be called the counterlateral antagonist of the superior oblique, which is the primary palsied muscle in the side. Oh, so now, one more time. Let us have a look at this chart. What do you observe? The smaller field is present in which eye? It is present in the left eye. So considering and studying this left eye, you can actually observe here carefully that the entire chart of the central dot is shifted in a downward position and more towards a temporal side that is outside. That means the eye has hypotropia along with that exotropia. The eye is downwards and outwards. So this should actually ring a bell that where do we actually see a downward and outward eye? The field of view seems to be shrunken from all the sides, okay, except on the lateral side. So here there is the recordings are actually going outwards. That means on the lateral side, but the all the other side, it seems to be shrunken. So that means there is underaction of all the muscles except the lateral rectus. And you see this kink over here, that means that the superior oblique is also somewhat functioning in this muscle. So Considering the right eye, very difficult to comment, but you know that there's a very large field recording seems to have overaction of multiple muscle and the eye is also shifted upward and definitely the medial rectus seems to be underacting in this case. So what are we dealing with? We are actually dealing with a complete left eye third nerve palsy. Here all the muscle except the left eye lateral rectus and the superior oblique are actually involved. Now let us discuss the difference between paralytic and restrictive squint. Now this is asked a lot in examinations that how do you differentiate on his chart whether it's a neurogenic palsy or a restrictive or mechanical palsy. Now these charts that we actually observed, you can observe that there was actually a proportional spacing between the inner and the outer fields if you carefully observe. Okay, they look somewhat symmetrical and all those muscles equally that we studied, those will be present in case of a neurogenic palsy. However, what about a case of mechanical restriction? Suppose this is the head chart of a patient who has mechanical restriction. Say they have a left eye blowout fracture and there's an elevation deficit. Now carefully observing this chart, 
which one is the smaller chart so again a little bit difficult to comment but still if you see vertically compressed chart is present in the left eye okay and if you study this you will notice that the the central dot is shifted in the downward position that means there is a hypertropia and the fields are compressed you know in the vertical direction so fields are actually compressed in the vertical direction like this and there's that means that there's under action of the SR and inferior oblique that is superior rectus and inferior oblique now if it was a normal neurogenic palsy what will happen the antagonist will be overacting but here in this case if you notice carefully the inferior rectus which is the antagonist of superior rectus that is also underacting right so there is also an underaction of the inferior rectus so here there is no direct or ipsilateral antagonist overaction so that is one important point to remember the other eye if you see however what is there the central dot is not shifted much however the fields are compressed horizontally in this condition and there is actually an overaction of the SR, IO, the superior oblique, inferior oblique and the inferior rectus which can be called as the counterlateral antagonist. So overaction of the counterlateral antagonist is definitely present in this case of mechanical restriction but the ipsilateral or direct antagonist is not showing the muscle sequelae. So apart from that here one important point is that you are seeing in these chart restrictions or underactions in opposing direction of the movement. So that is one important point. So this was a right eye blowout fracture with restricted elevation and the counterlateral antagonists were uh, overacting and that was the only muscle sequelae that you see in case of mechanical restrictions. Now what about this chart over here? So carefully observe again an asymmetrical looking chart. chart. There is a smaller field in right eye and the central dot is not shifted much there's a compressed field superiorly much restricted to the area of inferior oblique okay so it is disproportional there's restriction or underaction in the up case so this is actually a right eye brown syndrome and this field is called a dog ear field because it looks like this folded ear of a dog similarly have a look at this this one is a left eye duance retraction syndrome where there is an abduction limitation so the eye is actually going to be in esotropia this is called type a duan syndrome and in the right eye you can see that there is actually overaction of the medial rectus that is a counterlateral antagonist so now observe these restrictive charts that we just studied so what did we see these charts are disproportional. There is disproportional spacing between the inner and the outer fields. They are compressed either horizontally or vertically. And the muscle sequelae are the only muscle sequelae that you're going to see in case of restrictive pathology is marked overaction of the counterlateral synergist. Okay, the other muscle sequelae will not be present. So all these points go in favor of mechanical or restrictive palsy. So that was all for today. I hope you liked the video. Thank you for your patience listening. Have a nice day.